Amy says it all, we will be considerate. That's with the A-T-E at the end. We'll all be considerate of one another tonight. Okay, this is meant to be a discussion, a conversation. It is not a confrontation. It is not a debate. There's a lot of sides to education. And when we talk about education, we're talking about children. So it's emotional. Um, and there are many points of view. We hope that you will all listen tonight, as well as formulate questions, but also to really listen to some of the ideas. We have a panel of four tonight, and in an effort to make this as fair as possible, responses. We'll have four minutes for an opening statement, which I'm in television. Four minutes to me seems like an eternity. Uh, but we'll keep it at four minutes, and then uh, we'll go along with that for the rest of the evening for the questions as well. You may also go talk to each other, and that is our hope, um, that if you have, uh, want to engage with each other in a civil manner, um, that we may also be able to facilitate that as well, as long as you just don't talk to someone else. You'll be able to see the time. Um, it is right there in the center of the table, but I will jump in politely, uh, if need be, to move on to uh, the next question. The considerate co-chairs have stability bells. And if you do hear the bell, you are asked to perhaps change your tone. The civility bell will be used when it's needed. Just a little reminder to maybe rein it in a little bit. Um, of course, no personal attacks. The bell momentarily pauses the discussion so that we can then move on in a civil manner. It can also be rung if the audience uh, is reacting in a manner that our co-chairs do not think is appropriate. So we ask that you not comment out loud on anything that the panelists are saying. We also ask you not to applaud or to show any sign of agreeing or disagreeing. There's no negative or positive responses, really no right or wrong tonight. The idea is to just bring the ideas to the table. And anything else really just distracts us from that conversation. Our considerate co-chairs are State Senator Judy Schwenk and Chairman of the Berks County Commissioner, Christian Leibach. We thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> Committee members will set the topic and the direction of these programs. El Saeed El Marzuki, Bill Gage, Mary Cargo, Joan Munson, Karen Miller, Art Grimm, Kevin Murphy, Michael Rivera, and Mary Lou Rodriguez Bauer. There are a few times tonight when applause can be encouraged and allowed, and so I do ask that you recognize the committee now. We are inviting you, of course, and we're here this evening to be part of the conversation, and we want to involve you in that. So our considered correspondent this evening is Jason Rubrick, who's the Director of Communications at the Community Foundation. He will read your questions. So in the package that you receive, at the table when you sat down, there's a little form that you are to fill out to have a question. If you need another one, that's fine too. Um, fill out your questionnaire, uh, your questions, raise your hand, and someone will come around and collect it. So we really do encourage you to be part of this conversation. Put your thoughts on paper so that we then may ask the panelists those questions. And that will be towards the end of the program. David Myers, the founding director of the Opaque Institute for Ethics, Leadership of Public Service at Alberta University, and Kevin Murphy, President of the Community Foundation, will serve as fact checkers for us this evening if something needs to be clarified. The program tonight is being taped by BCTV and will be broadcast at a later date. You can help us also improve future considerate programs by filling out the questionnaire and the survey that's included in that packet on your table. So please do that and leave them on the tables for us to collect. So the topic tonight, let's get to it, school choice. We're going to break it down for you. In Pennsylvania, there's about 1.7 million students in pre-K through 12th grade. 500 school districts, almost 93% of these students are in district one schools. About 7.5 attend charter schools. In Berks County, 1,520 students are in cyber schools. It's a little more than 2% of our county school enrollment. 518 are in charter schools, that's 0.75%. Two enrollment trends that we're seeing since 0405. Total public enrollment has declined by 4.3%. The share of 
share of students enrolled in District 1 schools has declined, while enrollment in charter schools, including cyber charters, is on the rise. School choice, obviously one of the most important and perhaps controversial topics in education today. But what are the benefits and the advantages that it really brings for our children? I'd like to introduce the panelists for the evening. This is the abridged version, so you can get going. We'll start with Jonathan Sattel. He's the founding executive director of Penn Can, the Pennsylvania Campaign for Achievement Now, a nonprofit organization that seeks to build a movement to ensure every student in PA has access to a high quality education. Prior to Penn Can, he served as the director of strategic initiatives at KIPP Philadelphia Students, that's a network of public charter schools, beginning his career as a middle school reading and social studies teacher. We also have Dr. Carol Corbett Burris, Executive Director of the Network for Public Education, an advocacy group whose mission is to preserve, promote, improve, and strengthen public schools for both current and future generations of students. She's a former high school principal and has authored three books on educational equity. Allison Miley, she is the Deputy Director of Government Affairs for the American Federation for Children which seeks to improve our nation's K-12 education by advancing systemic and sustainable public policy that empowers parents, particularly those in low-income families, to choose the education they determine is best for their children. She has a law degree from Catholic University Law School. Dr. Julian Vasquez Heidling, also with us tonight, Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies and Director of the Doctorate in Educational Leadership at California State University in Sacramento. This current research includes quantitatively and qualitatively examining how high stakes testing and accountability based reform and market reform impact urban minority students. So let's begin tonight with opening statements. Done. Great. Well, uh, I just want to begin by uh, thanking the Community Foundation for hosting this really exciting uh, discussion. It's such a full room. And I have a full stomach, so I'm ready, I'm ready to get going. Uh, as, as in my quick bio, you know, I started out in education as a teacher, and so I, I approached this from the perspective of a former educator. And so it actually, it made, as I was walking in, I realized I saw a lot of, I didn't recognize many names, but I saw, I'm gonna, I have a, a hunch that there's a lot of educators in the room. And so, I just, as I show hands, I'm curious, can you raise your hand if you're a teacher or a former teacher? Excellent. So, yeah, so thank you for your, for your service and uh, for coming out. Uh, back to school is a tough time of year, so thanks for being here. Um, so, my, today we're talking about choice, and I think what we have to, the question can't be should there be school choice in Pennsylvania, because as the data already revealed, there is. But more importantly, we know that there, there's, there's, even before charter schools and cyber charter schools, and, there's been choice in Pennsylvania. Um, it's just that, that choice has not been distributed equally uh, amongst populations. And so what I mean by that is, is upper class and middle class families have ex exercised school choice fundamentally. It's so part of the fabric they don't realize. The primary mode of school choice in a region like Morris County is, is the ability to move. And so a wide missing school district, the Schuylkill Valley School District, those are strong communities because people have moved there uh, as a, an exercise school choice because of high quality schools. Um, another way that upper middle class families are able to exercise school choice is by paying for private school tuition uh, if they're not satisfied with those school districts. Or a third way that we often don't think about is a lot of our large urban districts have um, have magnet school programs or these kind of specialty programs and we know that upper middle class families have access to social capital that allows them to figure out how to get into these programs and so they're exercising school choice all the time. If you compare that to the experience of a, of a low income child, a child in, in Reading, if, you know, they don't, if they can't afford to move, if they can't afford private school tuition, they don't have that social capital to be able to figure out to get into um, a specialty program. You know, then, you know, there's one public high school in Reading. That's their, that's their only option. 
Now, for many families, that's a great choice. If that's the case, that's wonderful. But we know that there's a family that thinks that for safety, or for academics, or for religious values, that that's not the right fit for them. My organization strongly believes that the state of Pennsylvania should be figuring out ways to give that child more options, with the ultimate goal of making sure that every student has access to a quality education. And so I'll, I'll end my opening with, with you know, I, we can't talk about policy without talking about politics, right? I, um, we're gonna, you know, I, I'm not allowed to be partisan, and I won't. I'm a nonpartisan organization, but um, uh, I think it's important to recognize that it's the word school choice. I think if I did a word association game, people would likely associate that with, uh, if not a Republican, then a lean conservative brand. But the reality is that the concept of choice uh, is a bipartisan idea, whether it's that we're talking about the fact that a popular president for the last eight years under Barack Obama was embracing the issue. Popular Democrats in the Senate like Cory Booker. The big ed education reform issues like Common Core were signed into law under Governor Rendell. You know, this is, these are bipartisan issues. Um, and, and so I think we should be able to talk about this pragmatically. And, and, the, and what's really cool is I was sitting next to a guy. He didn't know that I was on this panel, but I asked him Richard if I could repeat what he said. His name is Mike Toledo. He's the CEO of Centro Hispano. And he just said, you know, here's my position. He said, everyone believes that kids should have access to choice. Um, the, oh, there's my time. He just said, everyone believes that they should have access to choice. It's just making sure that it's a high quality choice. And I, I think that is such a great message. Carol, you know, in the state of Nebraska, kids can go to any public school they want to, and there's not one charter. And the same is true in the state of Vermont. If we were talking about public school choice on this panel, we would probably find that we agree more than we disagree. But the truth of the matter is we're really not. What we're talking about is something different. We're talking about privatized school choice. Now, John said, and I think Allison would agree, um, that parents are the ones who know what is best for their child, and therefore they should have lots of options. I mean, that's what the argument is. And it's a very compelling argument, but I think we need to start to take a look at what some of the choices actually are. For example, one of the choices that are out there is something called education savings accounts, or ESAs. They're popular now in many states. In the state of Arizona, if you choose not to send your child to a public school, you get 90% of what the public school district would have spent on a debit card. Parents do not have to show that their child has learned anything. There have been cases where parents have bought big screen TVs, family planning services, board games, and have purchased items that were educational and then returned them for a store credit. Now this is something that is that is in favor of the United States and supported by Betsy Phillips. Now is that a good choice? Well, we talk a little bit about cyber charters. If you look at cyber charters nationally, the graduation rate is 40%. Credo, a research organization that is a pro-charter research organization, did a study that showed that kids that attend cyber charters lose 180 days of instruction in mathematics, which means they learn no math at all. Now, is that a good choice for kids? I visited charter schools in strip malls in California, where a child as young as 11 is only required to go two hours a week. So I guess the question is this. Why are we allowing bad choices to be funded and marketed with our tax dollars? There are charter school scandals every day. I follow them. Here are four in one week, the past week. Baton Rouge, charter principal locked a five-year-old girl in a closet with roaches and spiders. Nashville, a charter chain pays $2.2 million lawsuit because they use students' personal data to spam their parents. Atlanta, charter school founder, 55 counts of forgery and theft of at least $1.3 million. New Mexico, an employee funneled over $475,000 from the school to his personal bank account. These are happening all over the country. You've had your scandals here in Pennsylvania. And this continual parade of scandals, and it's not getting any better, is why a recent poll showed that public support for charter schools has dropped 12 percentage points in just one year. 
Now, there are people on this panel who will also probably argue that money should follow the child. They give it, I think the term is backpack funding, which sounds very nice. But if you read the recent editorial in the Philadelphia Inquirer, you're seeing that it's starting to actually bankrupt a lot of the school districts because there are stranded costs that we can talk about later. Public education is the pillar of our democracy. It is the place where children of all races, all creeds, different socioeconomic status, all can meet together and learn together. And certainly it's not a perfect system. And we have to do a much better job of integrating our neighborhoods. But if we continue down this road of creating all of these choices and parallel school systems, we're going to lose public education. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as Karen mentioned, I live in Ohio. I live in Columbus, Ohio. I grew up in a rural part of Ohio called Greenville on the western side. Uh, went to the public schools there. The only choice we had was when I was in high school, I went to um, college courses while still in high school. Uh, and then I went to college and then started working at the Ohio House. And uh, my boss at the time chaired the House Education Committee. So I had to sit there and listen to parents coming in and talking about their children and what they were going through. Um, and what got me into supporting school choice was hearing from parents talking about their students being bullied or hearing from a student with dyslexia come in and talk about not being able to learn in class and sitting in class and just falling further and further behind. So I work for the American Federation for Children. We're a national advocacy organization. Uh, we focus on students rather than one particular system. We believe parents should be in charge of choosing where to send their children. And that can be any option available. Traditional public schools, public charter schools, which are public schools, uh, e-schools, um, a blended learning model. Many schools are integrating um, e-learning because they recognize the importance there. Um, homeschooling, private schooling through state-funded scholarships, education savings accounts, uh, runs the gamut. Not every choice out there is the perfect fit for every child, but we believe parents should be in the driver's seat of choosing which option is best for their kid because they know their children best. Uh, so if the public charter school isn't working for them, they should be able to choose a different option. Maybe they should be going back to the traditional public school or uh, as John mentioned, there are magnet schools that they can attend that are more focused either being on arts or STEM education. So whatever the child needs, we want there to be options out there for parents to get. I will, one other thing, since I have a couple minutes left, um, AMC did a poll earlier this year. We do one every year. We have a Democratic polling firm conducted. Uh, the question that we ask folks, um, because we think this is most important to, to make sure you know which question's being asked, uh, we ask, generally speaking, would you say you favor or oppose the concept of school choice? School choice gives parents the right to use the tax dollars associated with their child's education to send their child to the public or private school which better serves their needs. And in our January 2017 poll, we found that 68% of respondents support school choice. Um, and we had 28% say they oppose, um, but we have 40% strongly favor it. So we see an upward trend. Uh, you may have seen a poll come out recently by Jen Forward about millennials supporting more school choice. So I think if we get away from it's an us versus them and this side versus this side, we can really get into, okay, parents want to pick where to send their kids. They know their children best. Let's make sure we have high quality options for each kid and then move on from there. So thank you so much for having us. Um, this is a I also should apologize. I have less voice than I usually do because I was yelling at the Detroit Lions to beat the New York Giants last night. So apologize for that. Um, so Donald Trump during his campaign promised to spend $20 billion on school choice, charters, and vouchers. So I think this conversation is more important than it has been in a very long time. But many in the civil rights community have been, become very concerned about the lack of transparency and accountability for charter schools. This culminated last year in a call for a moratorium on charter schools from the NAACP, the Movement for Black Lives, 
and the journey for justice. So what are the concerns of the civil rights community? Last year's NAACP resolution about the moratorium, it caught a lot of attention. But I think it's important to understand that our nation's vanguard organization for civil rights has been concerned about charter schools for a long time. In 2010, the NAACP passed a resolution that said, quote, charter schools draw funding away from already underfunded neighborhood public schools. This is certainly an issue here in Reading and in Pennsylvania, considering the way traditional charter schools are funded here and the way cyber charters are funded. In 2014, the NAACP passed a resolution that said, NAACP opposes the privatization of public schools, opposes public money for for-profit schools, opposes the redirect of money from public schools to charter schools. All certainly issues here in Pennsylvania. Then in 2016, because charter proponents had been largely unwilling in Pennsylvania and many other states to pass transparency and accountability for charter schools, the NAACP called for more time. Now I want to tell you about the 2017 NAACP resolution that you may not have heard about yet. More than 60 years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously in Brown v. Board. But now our schools are more segregated than they've ever been before. In the summer of 2017, the 2,000 delegates at the National Convention spoke on this in a uh, resolution called Public and Charter Schools Fulfilling the Promise of Brown versus Board. And it decried the segregation of African-American students in under-resourced public schools and charters. The intensification of segregation in charters is especially important for African-Americans because one in eight students now attend a charter school. This is not a boutique thing anymore. A national research study found that charter schools are more racially isolated than neighborhood public schools. And that a big problem is that parents actually choose to send their kids to more segregated charters than the less segregated neighborhood schools that they attend. The same study also found that achievement on average, quote, the relatively large negative effect on charter schools and the achievement of African American students is driven by students who transfer into charter schools that are racially isolated than the schools they have left, end quote. Which is why we must talk about the achievement data here in Pennsylvania right now. And I would like to say, just allow me to be a stats professor, just for a second. Here is the actual data on charter schools. This red line is the negative impact that charters have overall on students in this state. This is the data, 2011 credo from the fact here. Here is the impact by school level, elementary, middle, high. You can see here that traditional public schools, neighborhood public schools outperform charters across the board in this state. Here it is by a uh, number of years that the schools have been open, neighborhood public schools win again, just like the Detroit Lions or the New York Giants. Also, how long you've been in a school, first year, second year, third year, neighborhood public schools still outperform charter schools. And then probably the most, the biggest travesty and the legislators in Harrisburg should be embarrassed, which is that the 17 cyber charters, which seem to be changing their names, one in every five cyber charter students in the United States is from Pennsylvania. Look at how bad the effect is. We'll get back to that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your So since the majority of students in the U.S. are in a traditional public school setting, that's what the stats are telling us, this is a question for all of you. What impact is school choice having, good or bad, that you're seeing on our public school systems? And Allison, we'll start with you. I'm not sure where to begin. I mean, I think <coughs> it depends on where, which states you're looking at. I mean, yes, most for most families, the traditional public school is the right choice. Um, and you see with programs like the Cleveland Scholarship in Ohio, that is open to all Cleveland students. Any child living within Cleveland City, Cleveland Municipal School District is eligible for school choice. But not every student takes it. So I wonder, you know, there are a lot of states that don't have school choice right now. Um, but there is a, I mean, there are not that many students leaving on the grand scheme of things on the whole. Uh, and like I said, when you see states like or cities like Cleveland, where um, you have about eight, nine thousand students on the scholarship, and I want to say thirty to thirty-five thousand still in the Cleveland district, um, the impact obviously there are more students still choosing to go to the Cleveland district, 
And you see that with other programs where you have a performance-based model where the district, if you are going to what is it, a failing school, which I think that we have those programs that you do in a failing school. Um, but in those districts where a school is eligible, a public school, and the kids who go there are eligible, you don't have all of the students leaving. So, you know, it's a handful of students who are leaving, and yes, that will impact the school, but the dollars ought to follow the child to wherever they're going, and school shouldn't be receiving dollars for a child who's not going there. Thank you. Julian, uh, same question. What impact is this place having on our public school? Well, I think one of the biggest things, uh, the, the, the debate that's happening here in Reading between the, uh, is it I can, I teach, I can't remember the name of the name of the term. Yes. What's happening here is actually a microcosm of what's happening across the United States. Uh, and a recent study in Los Angeles found that charter schools are pulling down a half a billion dollars from the LA school district. Uh, so, you know, we didn't really think about well, what is the impact of charter schools on the economies of scale of our traditional public schools? And what does that mean for the students who are in the traditional public schools? Well, what the studies are finding is that it's increasing class size, that uh, uh, traditional neighborhood school districts are not able to afford uh, 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 veteran teachers. So there's all these impacts on traditional districts that we didn't even really think about. California, for example, we are finding that um, a recent study found that we wasted $200 million putting low-performing charter schools right next to the door to low-performing traditional public schools. And so I think we need to think about the economics of charter schools too. I think there's a slogan hearing about school choice. I think everybody believes that parents should have high quality of choice. Not only does it doesn't believe that, but we also need to think carefully about the data that's out there about what's actually going on in charter schools too. If, if I could jump in for a minute. To kind of bring it home to Pennsylvania, last December I had a conversation with Joe Roy, who's the superintendent of the Bethlehem School District, not too far from here. I think he's your superintendent here. And he did a study in his district, and he found that he was spending, had to budget $26 million for kids that were leaving Bethlehem schools for charter schools. But that if he brought all of those kids back to the district, he would save $20 million. That's a lot of money. You know, that's a lot of money that could go partially back to the taxpayers in Bethlehem, and then a lot of it used for the for the kids that are in the public school system. You, there are stranded costs. It's not simple that the, the money follows the kid. I mean, think about when you, you sent your kids off to college, right? And you paid room and board, and it was a heck of a lot of money for room and board. Maybe it was $7,000 or 10 or 12. I don't even know what it is now. You're probably laughing because it's probably much higher. My kids are all broke. But you didn't save that amount of money because they moved out of your house. You still had lights you had to put on. You had to pay your insurance, right? You have a cost that still remains. If one child leaves a classroom, it takes $12,000 with that, which is probably about average for Pennsylvania. <coughs> Just because the class size goes from 27 to 26, you don't save $12,000. And that's the problem when you have all of these parallel systems going. Eventually what happens is public schools can no longer function. And I have to tell you, that's part of the plan. When people call them government schools, when people disparage them all the time, there's, there's a lot of people in this country who believe that there shouldn't be public schools. So if you look at the American Federation for Children's website, search it. Find anything positive about a public school on it. You're not going to find it. Uh, so, a, a couple points I want to make. I think, well, already a couple times this Credo study has come up. I think it is an important uh, research organization that's done a lot of rigorous quantitative research to, because I think the, 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 there's, is it appropriate to ask this question, are charter schools working, right? I mean, we want to make sure that these are high quality choices, not choice for choice sake. Uh, Carol is absolutely correct that the study demonstrates that cyber schools in Pennsylvania are not making strong academic gains. Julian cited uh, a 2011, I believe, study um, that, showed, that was looking at more nationally. What they did not mention is the most recent Credo study, which actually looked into how charter schools are doing in serving 
uh, my, uh, low income students in our large urban districts and actually looked at, a, at Philadelphia as one of those, showed that they're making very strong gains. Uh, and as, so I think there's now strong evidence uh, that you, if you're going to use Credo, you have to use the full suite of research to show that they're, they're, they're making strong, uh, there's just really strong results. So the original question was how is special ways impacting the, the larger public school scene? Because let's, let's we have to always remember, the overwhelming majority of students go to traditional public schools and will continue to go to traditional public schools. We're, we're having this conversation in the context of Reading, where there's 18,000 students in the district and one charter school that serves 500 kids, right? And yet this is still already so political and controversial. So, uh, uh, so uh, the question was, how does this impact School. So I think there's two examples of, of how the innovation that happens in charter schools, school districts can learn from to, to improve, and that, that's the example of the system working. So in Philadelphia, um, some, a lot of the charter schools were doing things like extending the length of the school day, putting college, uh, creating a college-going culture uh, by, by branding their, their names of their classrooms, by the, the college. They were changing, having a, a different uniform policy. And suddenly, when there was a new superintendent who wanted to do district-level reforms, she Im implemented those reforms by taking the best practices of high-performance charter schools. That's an example of innovation starting in the charter school sector and moving over to traditional public schools. There's also a recent study in New York that showed that when charter schools were co-located, because we know New York real estate's expensive, facilities is the big issue in New York, when charter schools are co-located, um, as in they literally share a physical building with traditional public schools, those traditional public schools got better. There's a fascinating process of the osmosis of a culture of, of improvement is actually moving forward and improving traditional public schools. So I think we are seeing um, uh, charter schools helping districts overall. Uh, I'd like to see more of that, but unfortunately the nature of the conversation has become so political and so divisive that those two sectors aren't talking to each other. There's anything I hope that we can accomplish is to, is to kind of bring back this bit of collaboration to know that everyone is working on behalf of kids. Yeah. Can I just jump in about the study, that particular study? Please check in the Washington Post answer sheet. I did um, research analysis on that study, and it turns out that the only significant factor that was associated with the co-located schools was that the, the public schools that were co-located received more money, and it was a lot more money. And the achievement effects were really kind of very thin. Uh, that particular study is kind of suspect, and if you look at the majority of studies, because there have been more than that, there's been about 10 studies on that, what they found in terms of competition is that charter schools have no effect on the neighboring public schools. Can I have five seconds, too? Just a minute to respond. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that, with the, I mean, with, with the critique of that study. Uh, but I mean, I can only, I, Philadelphia is where I'm from. I know the data in Philadelphia very well. Um, what, what Philadelphia's done is embrace a model of charter schools. It's called the Renaissance Schools, where charter schools actually take over a low performing schools. And what we're seeing, we're seeing the schools in Philadelphia, we're seeing, uh, if you look at the, the lowest decile of schools, so the bottom 30,000, uh, or I guess that would be 20,000 students, you're seeing a lot more, less kids in failing schools, but overall in the system, and that to me is an example of charter schools helping rise the, the tide of the, of the whole system. So the, the first is, again, let me be the stats professor, which is what he talks about is a problem, uh, she, uh, Carol talked about is a problem of what we call endogeneity, which is what my mother would say is, what you think causes it isn't what actually causes it. <laughs> so the second thing, um, is I'm gonna be honest with everybody here, I actually laid a trap on the Credo study. Here's why. If you look at the Philadelphia Credo study from 2015, it does show a positive effect for charter schools overall. But if you read down on that study, it turns out that the positive effect is only for Asian and white students in charter schools. Charter schools actually have a negative effect on black and Latino students in that Credo study. So Wait, please, you're saying in Philadelphia, right? The, the 2015. I guess fact checkers yes. to look at that, please. <laughs> That's okay. All right, thank you. While they're fact checking that, I'd like to move on. Uh, this is I have a, a question for each of you, uh, so we'll just be one response, and then we'll move on uh, to a different topic. And later on, if you would like to address anything that someone has said, we can we can move into that. So 
Carol, we're going to start with you. Education really a global concern, not just here in Reading, not just in Pennsylvania, but global. So what can we learn from other countries that have adopted school choice models? Well, there are two countries that come to mind. One is Chile. Um, Chile adopted a full school choice model under uh, Pinochet. And what's happened over the years is that the achievement of students in Chile has been about the same. It's gotten maybe a little bit better. Their economy has gotten a lot better for other factors having absolutely nothing to do with school choice. But it's become more stratified. So you now have a system of municipal schools, which were the former public schools, where the poor go, the students with disabilities go. You then have a middle strata of schools that are voucher schools. However, parents don't get a full voucher, so there's different qualities, and what the family afford, well, that's kind of the quality of the school. And then you have elite schools, where the very wealthy go. So in a society that has so many problems as it is, what we saw was it, it starting to get torn apart. <coughs> and the people of Chile started to realize it. The students would go out on the street and march. We want our public schools back. But the truth of the matter is, is once you dissemble your public school system, it's almost impossible to put it back together again. Another example is Sweden. Sweden follows a voucher program. And what Sweden happens to be the only one of the Nordic nations with OECD, actually the only nation in OECD that has had its scores on international tests drawn. And what you also see in Sweden as well is again the stratification. You know, the idea, what winds up happening, and we know this in choice systems, and Julian talked about it before, is that systems become more segregated, and they become more segregated by wealth, and they become more segregated, I think, in the United States by, by race as well. Carol, thank you. Alison, a question for you. We focused in on charters, um, specifically a little bit of this conversation, because that's what we're seeing in our backyard. But it's a much larger conversation than this outside of Pennsylvania and really across the country. In your testimony for a house bill dealing with school choice, you said that your efforts focus on the students rather than the system. So let's talk about what other options there are and perhaps what we should be exploring. Sure, so uh, in Ohio, we have five state-funded scholarship programs. That's where a, parent or a family receives a set amount of money for their child uh, to use towards tuition and fees at the private school. So we have three non-special needs programs and two special needs programs. And they vary in eligibility and they vary in uh, scholarship amount. Um, and the schools that you can go to, the private school you can attend, uh, participates. They have to sign up, they have to follow certain regulations with the state. Um, all students on the scholarships have to take the state test. Um, and then uh, we have online public charter schools. Um, we have statewide, so any student from any school district may attend. Um, with our other public charter schools, it just really depends on where you live and whether or not there's a charter school that's nearby that you can attend. Um, in other states, there are tax credit scholarships. You do have those in Pennsylvania, with them in Alabama, and Arizona, for example. Um, that's where, instead of the state in the state budget, they're allocating funds to scholarship programs. Um, individuals or businesses can provide a contribution to a scholarship granting organization. Uh, that SGO then provides scholarships generally to low and middle income families. Um, in some states, I think it might vary on what the eligibility is for the students, uh, but AFC, we always focus on the low and middle income families since they're the ones who don't have choice right now. Um, so you do have those, you also have ESA programs, education savings accounts. Those are the ultimate parental choice program uh, where money is put into an account for the parents to use towards educational services. Um, usually a, an ESA bill will list out the different things that you're allowed to spend funds on. Um, and in Arizona, you as a parent have to file a quarterly report saying what you've spent the money on. So the treasurer, it's the treasurer, um, is tracking where spending is going. Um, and if money is misspent, they can 
to lock or just kick the family out of the program. Uh, so various options, um, you know, the ESA, it's big, like I said, it's the ultimate parental choice, but you have to be very diligent on making sure that you're choosing the right services for your child or the right curriculum or that sort of thing. Very involved. Um, there are a lot of people with children with special needs who are benefiting from ESA in Arizona. Uh, because as we know, special needs education costs a lot more than for a non-special needs child. Um, and a lot of times for, uh, with ESA funds you can um, spend that on services. Uh, there was a story about a child who, um, I think it was horseback riding was what helped her. And I can't remember her exact disability. Um, but that was something that she was able to use her ESA dollars for in addition to her actual education. So you have that, which is on one end, you've got scholarships in there, state funded, where you know, a parent every year they have to sign up, sign up their child, um, and they can go to school, work at Warner School, um, but it is a private school. So, kind of runs all kinds of Thank you, Alex. Jonathan, we'll go to you next. Uh, there are issue papers on the charter reform um, that was sent out as part of the reading list. There's sites of enrollment. Oh, we have a verdict. Sorry, we have, we have a fact checker. Yes, Dave, thank you. Um, what we found in looking at this study was that for all categories, charter schools did appear to do slightly better in performance than students in Philadelphia. They did not have the, the uh, performance of students a minority or Hispanic. I believe that's working. I heard what he said. You guys want me to say yeah. it? Well, wait, one more second. I think it might. From the Credo study, it appears that charter schools did relatively better with all categories of students in Philadelphia than the twin public school. At the same time, they did not improve the performance. Both saw declines in performance of Hispanic students. African American students, low income students. That's right. Thank you, Dean. So, Jonathan, back to you. These are just the, uh, the questions for each of you. Issue papers on um, charter reform were part of the reading list. Your site says enrollment in charter schools here in PA is one of the largest numbers in the nation. Uh, yet, the charter school law has gone untouched for 20 years. So talk about uh, charter law, charter reform, and what you would like to be seen, what you would like to be seen, excuse me, what you would like to see here. Yeah, thanks. So uh, Pennsylvania has passed the charter law in 1997, which means we've gone down 20 years without a major revision of the charter law. Uh, I think all sides can agree it's, it's a broken law. The Auditor General of the state uh, has called it the worst charter law in the nation. I think there's a little bit of hyperbole in that, but not much. Uh, and it's something that my organization has been working for, for over for five years now to fix, and it's proven to be very difficult. Um, as I don't have to tell an audience like this that uh, you know, I'm speaking to you on September 19th in the state without a budget. Uh, and so uh, anything difficult, let alone something, let alone something as challenging as, as charter reform, has been, has been a, a huge challenge. In terms of what I want to see, uh, I, I think it actually goes back to Mike's kind of pragmatic statement is how do we scale up high quality options while making it easier to, uh, to close low performing charters. It's the, the grand bargain of the charter school movement has always been more autonomy for, for more accountability. Um, so we need to do better on the accountability side. But right now it does, it remains uh, too difficult to uh, shut down a low performing charter school, but you can't do that unless you're also making it easier to scale up schools where there's high parental demand, where results are strong, where they're fulfilling um, their mission. I want to take a moment to talk about the more autonomy side, because I think that gets lost in the discussion. What do I mean when I say charter schools have more autonomy? They, they basically have freedom in three areas that I think are critical. Uh, and this is an area where I feel like 
it, the traditional public schools can and should be able to do this as well. Um, so they have flexibility over their budget. It's they, the local, the independent board can, has a lot of, uh, can do a lot with their budget. They have flexibility over their curriculum. So they have to teach the state standards. That's the what they teach, but the curriculum is um, they have flexibility over. But the third and most important one is their personnel. So they have complete flexibility over their personnel. And that means they can set their own compensation ladder. That means they can set their own unique rostering, their own types of positions. And then these autonomies is where you see the innovation happening. Um, and I absolutely think that we, if we shifted, instead of trying to make charter schools more like traditional public schools, but flip that and try to have a conversation around how do we make traditional public schools have more of these freedoms, um, I think we'd have a, a much more um, healthy education sector. And Julian, the title of one of your blog posts is With Charter Schools, a Step Back to Segregation. You've talked a little bit about this already, but do you see charter schools as racially isolating and do you feel we're taking a step backwards? Well, <clears throat> part of our sacred responsibility as academics is to say the things that are sometimes unpopular, but grounded in data and information. So just a couple of quick things. Uh, first, um, research on vouchers is our climate science. There are some people, there are very few studies funded by particular people that say that vouchers have a small positive impact. But the vast majority of research on neo-vouchers and on vouchers show that they are bad. In New Orleans, they're bad for kids. They have a negative impact, just like charters have a negative impact on African-American and Latino kids in Philadelphia and across the state. So I think that, that, that's the first important thing to say. And I think the second important thing to say is where vouchers and school choice came from uh, there's a lot of debate about this, but the person who primarily made this uh, very prominent discussion was Milton Friedman, who was a professor at the University of Chicago. And his idea was that with school choice, we could abolish the public school system. If you just type in Milton Friedman, abolish public schools, you will see many quotes uh, about his approach. That was the main uh, reason. This, the idea that it was for equity and access was retrograded on top of these pre-existing ideas about public education and public Good. Now, what a lot of people, especially legislators, know and old heads in politics is that the charter law in 97 was a compromise because they wanted vouchers. It's the same great bargain that happened in California and Texas and many other places. But they're still pushing for vouchers. They were not satisfied with charters as a market-based approach. Now, HB 97 is like a zombie. I like zombie movies. It keeps coming back from the dead in Pennsylvania. I live in California and I know this, right? And so the idea is that, you know, it's an idea that it's about transparency and accountability, but it actually provides less community access to information. It, it provides less controlled communities in the appeal board. It doesn't fix the cyber charters in Pennsylvania, which are one of the biggest problems out there in the state. So I think it's important that we not allow themes of equity and social justice be framed in the school choice conversation. I think I've presented a lot of data and information today that I hope that you will go home and fact check me. I hope the fact checkers fact check me because these are not the conversations that you're going to hear from. I'm just going to be straightforward and honest with you. You're not going to hear this from Kim. You're not going to hear this from Teach for America. You're not going to hear this from uh, Betsy DeVos. You're not going to hear this from AFC. So please, fact check. Go ahead, go home, and please fact check the things we're talking about. And a reminder, if you'd like to get in on the conversation, please take a moment, write your question down on a slip of paper at your table, raise your hand, and uh, Jason will be around to collect it, and we'll get to those um, in just a few moments. Um, Julian, you mentioned Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. That's actually my next question, so thank you for the segue into that. Um, she's promised the Trump administration will propose, quote, the most ambitious expansion of education choice in our nation's history and that states, not Washington, D.C., will make the decisions. So my question to all of you, uh, and you'll each get a moment to respond, what would you like to see coming out of Washington regarding education? And John, we'll start with you. Sure, so I think anybody who is a political animal, like I am, is, is, is smart enough to not be waiting on D.C. To, to, to accomplish anything. We, uh, People, education is unique amongst other amongst issues in that it's not a federal issue. It is a state-based issue. So in a district like Reading, uh, the, the, over, the, the 
I would guess, I don't know the numbers, probably somebody here does, but I bet you don't get more than 10% of your funding from the federal government. And I think the percent of your funding is proportionate to the percent of the influence, which means less than 10% of the influence of education policy comes from the federal government. The state is where the action is. So State Senator uh, Judy Schwanks has more power, I believe, than uh, Betsy DeVos in terms of what's going to change uh, education policy here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and, uh, and so we, that, that's to me where the, um, where the, the, the focus uh, of our attention should be. Um, um, I feel like there's a second part of your question, so I'm forgetting that I answer. Uh, my question was, what would you like to see coming out of Washington regarding education? You can change that a little since you've already answered that you don't believe that Washington is where the answers lie, uh, so you can use the rest of the time if you'd like to tell us then what you would like to see coming out of Pennsylvania. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so the, the reason that the state is is where the action is is one they control the majority of the funding for uh, not not for all districts but certainly for for our poor districts which are more dependent on state appropriation than their local property taxes and they control the major uh, education policy issues they control standards and assessments they control choice or charter schools and private and our private school scholarship tax credits and they control the teacher quality issues that I think are essential if we're talking about what it's going to take to to uh, reform a local district, whether that's issues like seniority or tenure reform. And so I, I want to see um, ultimately a grand bargain. That's what I, that is the pragmatic approach, which is Reading is also, we can't have a conversation about Reading without talking about funding. It's a grossly underfunded district. We start to make some progress in Pennsylvania in a rare act of bipartisanship by passing a new school funding formula, but that formula only uh, is, uh, allocates, it only applies to new dollars, which it means it's gonna take a whole lot of time to really achieve equity. So to me, the grand bargain is if we're gonna try to drive more dollars into that formula, then there has to be more dollars in exchange for some more reforms and accountability to ensure that those dollars are used well. So I can promise the number one way to build public support for more spending in districts, because let's be real, if we're talking about more spending in poor areas, we're asking taxpayers in wealthier areas to subsidize those districts. I believe that people would be willing to do that if they had confidence that those dollars were going to get a return on investment in those dollars. Right now, I feel that there's defeatism and a sense of complacency in a lot of districts that the sense is no, no matter how much money we spend, we're not going to see results. Because yes, Reading is underfunded, but Pittsburgh is, is technically an overfunded district based on adequacy targets, and they're not getting good results either. And so, uh, to summarize, more money in exchange for more reforms is, is the solution I want to see. Julian, uh, same question. Well, so I grew up in Michigan, which explains my Detroit Lions fandom. <laughs> so I, I go to the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press every single day. And the thing is, is that Bet Betsy DeVos' vision for education is not a vision I think that's in our best interest. More than 90% of the schools that are privately controlled, 80% of their charters are for profit. She spent thousands of dollars trying to change, this, trying to change the state constitution to allow the dollars to flow directly to uh, religious schools. That's not the vision um, that I think is best for our nation. Now, I don't want to be that person that sits up. I, I've given you a lot of bad news today. So let me give you a little bit of good news. There are alternative approaches. The last 10 years of education reform have been talking about top-down private control and privatization of our schools. So I think that we should be thinking about community-based approaches to reform. Whether they be, whether they be uh, community-based accountability, we have something called local accountability in California. One of the interesting things about uh, your conversation about uh, uh, funding is that that's where No Child Left Behind actually came from. I was in Texas during the Texas miracle before No Child Left Behind went to the whole United States. I worked in the Houston School District. And the reason why we got more child left behind was because the legislators there said, look, if we're going to put more money into the system, then we want accountability. And that's where the testing came from. That's where the accountability came from. And so we have to think about community-based, more democratic approaches to education instead of less democracy and more privatization. Thank you, Julie. Awesome. So I guess I, I go a little bit along with what John has to say in that a whole lot coming down top down, um, only because I very much believe in local control. I mean, Ohio is a local control state. Um, I think a lot of states are. Um, those are the folks that know best what's going on in their districts. Uh, so they ought to know best what uh, policies to put in place. 
Um, there are federal regulations like IDEA, the special needs law, uh, that are great to come in place. We do need to have that, and there are dollars tied to that. But where we can have flexibility to districts and to states, we should have that. I believe a lot of states in there um, recently filed ESSA plans. I think they were all due last week. Um, several states had them already approved. I don't know where you guys are here. Um, Submitted on Monday. Okay. Um, I believe Ohio just turned up and filed ours um, right on the deadline, right up to the minute. Um, but I think in a lot of those plans, um, the U.S. Department was looking for innovative um, ideas from the states and from the state departments because each state is very different. Although we are neighbors of Ohio, Pennsylvania, it is very different. I would say, you know, when you get right up to the border, sure, it's very similar, but then obviously Philadelphia is on the East Coast. Very, very different from where I grew up on Greenville, on the other side of Ohio. So the state legislators and the state leaders and the state district leaders and teachers and principals, they're the ones um, of, in all of our schools who are the ones who, who know best how those federal funds ought to be spent. So I just think flexibility is the way to go. Well, this is probably a place where, where I do agree. Um, between NCLB and Race to the Top, I mean, let's hope that that era of interference um, is, is over. Um, I think the role of the federal government in education um, has, has to be about protection, um, protecting the rights of students with disabilities, making sure um, that laws are put in place that allow for segregation, making sure that students' rights are are protected. That's the good. That that's where the federal government needs to be the watchdog because we don't want to go back, and we could easily go back in time to to things like segregation academies, which was also part of the beginning of the of of the voucher movement. And there was a role for funding and equalization. I mean, one of the things that's concerning me now is that the education budget um, that is being put forth by the House and supported by the Trump administration and Voss cutting $2 billion from Title II. That's a lot of money. You're going to feel it. And where that money has been spent is it's been spent on teachers. Right? It happened after 2008 with the recession, where that money was put in, and there are something, you know, there are just thousands of teachers who will lose their job, and, and the funding is used to reduce class size, and it's used for teacher professional development, which is extremely important, especially at a time where we are facing a national teacher shortage. And a lot of it is because we've been battering on public schools and battering on public school teachers and evaluating by test scores. Nobody wants to go in the profession anymore. Those of us who were in it, we saw this train coming. So um, those Title II monies and the monies that are, that are given uh, from the federal government to the states, especially for schools that are underfunded, for schools with large shares of students who live in poverty, um, that's where that's where the role should be. But in terms of telling us how to evaluate teachers and what kind of tests to give and when, thanks, but no thanks, both Democrats and Republicans. Thank you, Carol. Can I add one quick point? Uh, so I, I actually don't think there's. I don't, you'll correct me if I'm if I'm mistaken. I don't think there's an inherent tension between your vision of local, uh, of, of kind of community-based schooling, uh, with my vision of choice. But because to me that, that if there's a model that the beauty of a choice model is, I, I don't think we know exactly what works yet. And I think we want to see a lot of different options. And so if there's a community model that's working, that should, that should, be, a, that should be a choice. But I, I guess what, what I fear is, to, the, the most important thing we have to look at is proof. There's not a single district yet in the country where, where, that we, where we're actually fulfilling the promise of the meritocracy and the American dream where all kids are afforded equal opportunity. There absolutely, though, is schools that are examples of low-income kids that are getting transformative results. And I think if you look, looking at the schools is, 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 is the right approach. I have not yet seen I, I, uh, examples of where the model that you're describing has yet, has, has yet proven transformative results for those kids. If there are, my organization would absolutely support scaling those up and investing in them. And the other example of that is 
is I, I, we've had a, I, the issue of racial segregation has come up uh, throughout this conversation. It's something I care deeply about. Is, is trying to solve the problem of the fact that our schools are as segregated, if not more segregated, than before Brown. I mean, the history of of, of, of white flight in schools is, was a traditional public school problem long before there were charter schools. And I guess let's assume we can get rid of we get that moratorium on charter schools. We we've cut. How have we solved for 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 integration? If, if there is a policy idea around what it's going to take to integrate schools, uh, I, my organization strongly support that. I have not yet seen that kind of policy come up. In fact, the few areas where I've seen diverse school models have been some of these diverse, purposely integrated charter schools that have set up um, in order to do that. Um, I, I just haven't I haven't seen it, but I, you know, if there's there, please please correct me. I'd love to give you an example. Go visit Rockville Center, where I was principal of the high school for 15 years. What percent economic uh, low income? Uh, 15 percent. 15. 15 to 16 percent. But that's not to be scoffed at. Sure. We're children of poor children, and there are more low income kids in that high school than there are in an awful lot of charter schools. And that's a district where, when I left for the last three years, 100 percent of all kids graduated with the New York State Regents Diploma. But Philadelphia is 90 percent of there, well, you know, but that always becomes the thing. Well, if it's not exactly like this, you ask for an example, I'm giving you an example. Go visit. Okay, let's move on to. Uh, two, 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 two,
monitoring, supervising, and regulating um, charter schools. And I think it's on them, if there's cases of that, to look into that and make sure that's not happening. And that, if, if they're doing that, they're violating the law. And that is some, a subject for uh, a non-renewal. And so um, I've heard anecdotal examples. The studies that I've seen to actually look into this have not uh, proven widespread examples of this happening. If you look at just aggregate data, charter schools are serving the same percentage of special needs students. Now, of course, special needs is binary. It doesn't show the range of, of disability. I have not seen a, um, a study on that. On the accountability piece, I strongly believe that charter schools are much more accountable than traditional public schools for two reasons. Number one, no one is, charter schools can only exist if parents show up. So they're ultimately fundamentally accountable to the parents. Uh, and, and which is a, a, a is not a kind, there's not that kind of market driven accountability that you see in traditional public schools. And second, every five years they're subject for renewal. Imagine if we had traditional public schools that every five years had to go up and be voted to have the right to continue to exist. Now we're not doing enough of that. We're, uh, and even though school districts have the legal authority to do it, they're not shutting the, uh, up them down to the extent that they can. And I think that's something that in, in charter law we should be able to fix. Then third, cyber schools, I remember now. Um, oh boy, I don't have enough time to talk about cyber schools. I'll punt on that one, I'll, I'll, I need way more than four minutes. <laughs> you still have time. Oh, oh, I do? Oh, okay, great. All right, cyber schools. Cyber schools has been a challenge for me uh, for, for five years. I, I will share that I originally came, approached it from a pure choice perspective. Um, there's 30,000 families in cyber schools. They are, I, I trust parents, they're not idiots. And even if the data is showing they're not academically performing, who am I to, to tell a parent whose kid may feel like they're, it's unsafe to go to work, who may be a, a ballerina and needs to spend 80 hours of practice and they want that, whose religious values may be so um, alternative that there's no school they can find. I have no idea. Who am I to suggest? I have since been persuaded by just the sheer data that shows that cyber schools are not achieving that I, I feel like it is appropriate to say that we, we, the model itself as it stands isn't working. 100% online instruction. But there's a, there's a happy medium, there's a gray area. 100% online instruction doesn't work, but we have to move to a more blended model where there's some uh, in-person instruction, some blended. What, the reason we don't do this right now, there's a regulatory gray area. If you're, to be a cyber school, you have to be 100% online. If you actually require kids to show up to the buildings, they, the, the, the state can shut you down because you're violating the law. Um, and so we actually have to make it easier to, to move to, towards a blended model. If there's cyber schools that are working, uh, let's do it. There's, right now, I think it's fair to say there's no cyber schools working um, in Pennsylvania. All right. <laughs> All right, Carol. Because I talk fast. <laughs> yeah, would you? <laughs> there's a couple of parts. There were several parts there. I want to make sure we get it correct. Would you um, repeat the question, please? Yeah, let me go back to these. Should charter schools be accountable for accepting students with disabilities at the same rate as public schools in these categories, intellectual disabilities, autism, emotional disturbance? Should charter schools, regardless of students they serve, be held to the same academic standards as the public schools they are trying to pull students from? And then finally was the um, question about uh, tightening up accountability on cyber charters and uh, how national charter organizations have encouraged state legislatures to do that. Great, so, so let's talk about the, the first. I was surprised uh, what, to hear John say that the rate of students with disabilities are the same in charter schools as they are in public schools. I don't believe that's the case. I don't know your statistics for Pennsylvania, but I, I do know that I remember seeing a study for Pennsylvania that showed huge disparities in the types of disabilities that the kids have. And, and, and that's really important. Um, as a high school principal who had a fabulous program in the high school for, for kids with very severe disabilities, such as Down syndrome and, and autism, I can tell you um, that, that the kids with those disabilities cost a lot of money to do a really good job with them. And um, that's very different than, for example, a child that has an IEP for a mild speech disability. And what you see in charter schools all over the United States 
and maybe Pennsylvania is the exception, is one fewer kids with disabilities, and then very big differences in the type of disability that, that the child has. And one of the problems that you have in Pennsylvania, and I know it's one that the legislature almost fixed, is that if a child goes to a charter school and they have a disability, that the charter school, even if it's a very mild disability, receives an awful lot of money. I think they, they take the average. So now you have this really difficult situation where the most disabled children, who are the most expensive to teach, are in your public schools. And all of that funding is going out. And I think you, you, know, you have to start to say, when you see that disproportionality, what is it in the water and what is it in the air that's making the families of very disabled children feel as though their child cannot fit in to a charter school, okay? And a lot of times it's kind of dog whistles, like the child will appear at a charter school door, and I've heard this a lot anecdotally when I went and I visited Bethlehem, and they kind of look and they go, oh, your child's going into third grade? Well, I'm looking at this, and we think maybe that child needs to be in second grade. Well, kids don't want to be retained. Okay? And we see this in New York City. So very often what happens is that parents, the children that are the most uh, challenging to teach are not welcomed in the charter school, and that creates a, a big problem. Regarding cyber charters, I mean, I'm 100 square with John on that. I, I mean, I just don't get it. I'm always amazed when people say, well, kids need to go to a cyber school because they've been bullied. My gosh, I was the high school principal. It's cyber bullying, and that's where all the bullying is happening. Um, it, there, it just doesn't, I can tell you, is working with adolescents for 25 years. It is not a good, healthy thing for a child to be home on a computer all day. And we have so much data that shows that kids aren't learning. You know, we talk about a lot tonight about families having a choice and families' interests. Public education, we are all interested in public education. We all have a stake in producing citizens. This isn't just a consumer game. You know, it's like, if I don't like my public library, give me a gift card to Barnes & Noble. I mean, there's, we have a civic responsibility for all kids, and there's a heck of a lot of money that are creating all of these systems that we know aren't working, and then we go, well, yeah, but parents need choice. I don't think it's a very responsible thing for us to do. I think we're going to regret this decision. Thank you, Kevin. We, we did yeah. do some quick checking. We found three school districts, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Erie. Uh, 2014, 2015, proportions of special ed students served by public schools compared to charter schools. And in all three districts, the public schools enrolled substantially more uh, special education students than the charter schools did. The only one where there was any sort of comparability was in Philadelphia, and that was speech and language impairment students. Thank you, David. Thank you for that check. Allison, you can tackle <laughs> all or any of the above. Um, I would just, one thing that I feel gets left out of the conversation a lot with school choice is that when we're talking about, this is not me gnashing any public school districts, because again, that is a great option. It is one of the many options. Uh, but when we're talking about how many special needs students are enrolled in a district, those students live within that zip code and they're assigned to that school. Now I don't know anecdotally what is going on in a charter school is turning away a special needs child. I would hope that, that wasn't happening because they are not supposed to. Um, but by enrollment, since you're assigned there, that is where you're supposed to go. So if you don't have any other options as a parent, you have to send your kid to where you're assigned based on where you live. Um, on academic accountability, yes, all of our schools need to be accountable. Um, as John noted, the best accountability measure is parents because no one, no parent has to send their kid to a private school or a charter school or enroll them in an online school. But for whatever reason, whether it's because they weren't getting the academic um, uh, 
they weren't learning, really, is what it boils down to. They're just not learning where they were assigned, where they had to go, or there was bullying, or you know, there's a you know, a child with dyslexia who, even when they get to fourth grade, they're still struggling reading. They're still swapping words here and there, and they're just slightly behind. And so they just need a little bit extra time from someone, and for whatever reason, they're just not quite getting that at their science school. So they just need another option, you know. And I think that's what triggers really just it's one of the many options on online schools you know it is not for everyone um, as I mentioned actually earlier um, but we've got we do have some excellent online schools and for whatever reason that is something that works for, for a child maybe that child has an illness where they're in the hospital a lot so under chronic absenteeism laws they would be deemed truant or just chronically absent from their assigned school so an online school would be a more appropriate um, a more appropriate school for them, or perhaps they're in some sport. Oh, I was reading about a child attends Connections Academy in Ohio. Uh, I believe he does some sort of karate, but I don't think that's the exact word. But he's some superstar who's you know trained to be on the Olympic team, the U.S. Olympic team someday. And so because of the training schedule, um, there's another gal who's a figure skater. Um, because of their schedules and their goals and being these athletes the online school works. It does take, it is, um, you know, you have to be very self-reliant, um, but also Connections Academy has in place, they put it into place themselves, where if a student has not logged in enough hours, the parents are by. So it's like if the school were to call in the morning and say, hey, April hasn't shown up to school today. Similar situation, it's just being done online. Now I don't know all the tech out there anymore. We have become so advanced in our tech um, lately, so I'm sure that there are things that could be put into place that could be, um, that could make our online schools more accountable. Um, I don't know exactly what those are, um, but I do know that it is a viable, appropriate option for many students. So she's an Ohio State grad. I'm a Michigan grad. So she talked about athletes. Let me take it there just for a minute. K-12 Bank Cyber Charter. NCAA said that you cannot be eligible to play football if you go to this cyber charter. So I highly recommend it if you have athletes that want to go to Ohio State, that they should go to K-12 because then they would be ineligible to play. <laughs> uh, so I'm the sheer data piece. Uh, it warmed my heart to hear you say that. And I need to confess, can I confess to everybody here today? I was an instructor at a charter school. I was a charter school board member, a charter school parent. I volunteered in the Minnesota charter school in the 1990s when they first got going. You're probably looking at me now thinking, well, what happened to Julie? It was the sheer amount of data. The sheer amount of data that changed my mind. So I hope that this, you know, the, the, the title of this is considered. So if, you, if you're on the fence or you're pro-charter, consider the data. It's, I think it's okay for us to change our mind. I think also on the special needs, a lot of times what will happen is, is we'll look at the state numbers on special needs and say, oh, well, they look, we'll eyeball them and say, oh, this is about the same number of VLLs, about the same number of special ed. But it's the drill down that matters. The fact checkers found, for example, in those three districts, that there was a difference in special ed enrollment between charters and traditional uh, neighborhood schools. We did a piece in the Stanford Law and Policy Review. In Houston, we drilled out even closer. What we did was is we took charter schools and we drew a one mile radius around them. And because neighborhoods is what we're really talking about here, and found that those charter schools served less special needs kids than the schools in your body. So we even more granularity to make that. Score. Um, I want to tell you two numbers too. 400,000 and 27 million. Now, fact checkers, I'm, I'm close on these numbers. I don't know if they're exact. Here's why I say these two numbers 27 million is what the charter school lobby spent in legislative races in California last year. They're sending a message. Now, we were talking about authorizers saying, oh, well, we don't think that this charter school's up to snuff. Well, as you and Redding know, that could cost you $400,000. So the idea that authorizers can just say, you know what, we're gonna pull your charter. 
because we're not satisfied with you know fill in the blank, that's going to start getting very expensive. And I, I think that what happened here in Reading, we're going to start seeing in a lot of other places because we're past this tipping point. Charter schools is no longer a boutique thing. Like I mentioned earlier, the NAACP found that one in eight black students now goes to a charter school. So that's something that we really need to consider. I really believe that what's happening here in Reading is a microcosm of what we're looking at in many cities across the United States in the coming years. Jason, the next question. I'm gonna again uh, combine some questions here. Uh, what role and rights should taxpayers have under school choice? And then the next question is, if a student who's attending a failing or violent public school is already at a deficit both academically and economically, what are parents who have an interest in quality education expected to do? How long are they expected to wait for solutions? And I think in an effort to get to more questions, if we could just have two of you answer this one. So I'll pose it to either Jonathan Take this one. Uh, you can take the next one, right? Uh, so first, what role and rights do the taxpayers get on school choice? So I hear a lot of, I don't want my high tax dollars going to religious schools, which I can understand. Uh, if you don't like that particular religion, you don't want your public funds going to a private entity. But I think on a much broader scale, we are not simply investing in one particular system. Yes, there are fixed costs at our, at our public schools that need to be addressed and need to be funded. Um, Reading School District, you guys have a lower per people amount than anyone else in the county, which I think is terrible and needs to be addressed. Uh, so yes, those are issues, but solving those issues, it, you can't solve those issues by simply bringing back the 500 some kids from ISD. Uh, because that, that may solve your, your black and white budget issue, but it's certainly not going to solve anything for the 500 kids who chose to leave. Um, so I think for taxpayers, for me, for somebody who, the other you know thing that comes up, um, and this is just on schools in general, um, why should people without children be paying for, have their tax dollars used for schools? Well, I am one of those people, but of course I want my tax dollars used to pay for schools. Because I want our folks up until they're 18, they're supposed to be in school, we assign them to school, or we, uh, not assign, but um, I'm going to compulsory education. We require them to go to school, whatever school that is, because we want them to learn. We want them to have a basis for which to go out. As soon as you become an adult, you can either go into the workforce, you can go to college, you can go to any number of things, but you have that basis to go off of, and that's what the investment is, and that's what taxpayers are to be investing in. So for me, if a child learns better at a private school or in a charter school than they did where they were assigned originally, then I would like for them to go to that choice school, because then they're going to learn, which is the whole point of compulsory education, um, and then you know, they can move on from there, and if they choose to go to college, that's great, if they choose to go into the workforce, we know that that's where they're, they're going to be ready to do that. I know there were several other parts of that question, but that was the only one I got, Jason. Jason, can you read the second part of the question? I think it was something about um, how long do students have to wait. I say they don't have any time to wait. Um, when you are, and I was this kid, way, it was way back when, in elementary school, um, very short amount of period, very short period of amount of time, uh, one year, thankfully, um, did not learn a whole lot. Next year comes along, had a great teacher, a very involved well parents who are very encouraging to read a lot from the library, et cetera, et cetera. But the teachers, well, my mom, you know, she's a little bit behind, so are the other kids from this classroom. I remember, even though it was a long time ago, I remember sitting in this class, um, you know, the following year, just getting so frustrated because I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand what the teacher was. I felt behind and I felt embarrassed and I didn't know what was going on. Thankfully, this teacher was great. The following teacher was great. The following teacher was great. Like I said, I had great parents. I have lots of brothers and sisters who were very, you know, we're all kind of learning from each other. 
Um, but not every kid has that. So for a kid to be told, or a parent to be told, you know what, you need to just hold on. Your child needs to wait. They're going to the public school. They just need to wait, see what happens. One year of wait time in a child's life is just far too long. So they need to get to a school. The parent says, this is where they're learning. This teacher and my kid are working really well together. There's just something going on there. For girls, you know, where we're assigned is doing really well. Just wasn't working. We just can't keep waiting. Okay. Well, how long do we have to wait for health care for everybody? How long do we have to wait for a high quality school in every neighborhood? Right? I, there's a lot of things that I think we are waiting for that have price tags attached to them. Um, and I think that uh, part of the challenge is that when they do surveys of school choice, parents say they want smaller class sizes, extracurriculars, AP courses, high quality teachers. The, those are the things that parents are waiting for, and all of those things have a price tag attached to them. And the worst part about this conversation is that we all know in this room, the nicer house you buy, the better public school you get. It's the elephant in the room. And it's a travesty, and we as Americans know this. Overall, the United States is in the top 10 or so. In some states, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, those are top five uh, compared to other countries in the world. We know that uh, wealthy communities are offering their kids excellent education. But we are providing poor children substandard, rationed education on purpose. On purpose. So it's not just, we're not just waiting for high quality schools. We're waiting for health care. We're being, waiting for environmental rights in places like Flint. There's a lot of things that we are waiting for our policymakers to do. Now, I think that there is some solutions here. In California, I talked about local accountability. I, I came of age in, in Texas during No Child Left Behind, and that was all top-down policy. Now, in California, they put together strategic plans on the local level, together with parents, civil rights communities, and others. Those plans received in, for example, in LA, a billion dollars from the state legislature to execute those accountability plans. Here's our strategic plan, here's the money that, that go with that strategic plan, and they're targeted specifically on low SES kids, foster kids, and immigrant kids. Those plans have to specifically say, here's how we will spend the money, and here's what communities are asking for. So that is what we're really talking about is that the elephant in the room is that we've decided that poor communities are going to get less than well communities, wealthy communities, and we're okay with that. Julian, I believe we have time for probably one more audience question. Okay. Um, let's go with this one. Please address the impact school choice has in a state like Pennsylvania that has one of the most racially inequitable funding mechanisms for public education in the country. Uh, I'll take that, but I'm going to use the, I'm going to use my first minute to, for those who've seen me furiously looking at my phone, I'm not checking fantasy football. I'm not being rude. I, I have been, I, I want to apologize. I, I pride myself on getting the facts right um, and, and following the numbers. And I hope I proved that by showing my evolution on the position of cyber schools. And I can confirm that I was, I was incorrect on, I've been texting my team on the special education numbers. So I fact checked the fact checkers and they're correct. <laughs> However, <laughs> so I'm one for one there. However, all I can say is I believe in what we'll litigate, I only want to litigate this because it's so essential to this idea. If charter schools are actually underperforming traditional public schools from serving low income kids, then I think, then, then a critical core part of my argument is undermined. And so I'm going to literally just read, as my team said, this is from the abstract of the, of the latest CREPA study. It's one paragraph, it won't take long. Researchers found that urban charter schools in Philadelphia, on average, achieve significantly greater student success in both math and reading than their traditional public school counterparts. Notably, minority students and students in poverty saw some of the largest benefits. In Philadelphia charter schools, black students receive the equivalent of an additional 29 days of reading and math instruction 
Hispanic students receive the equivalent of an additional 29 days of math instruction. I'm, I'm taking the risk of challenging a, a PhD in statistics, and so if I am wrong, I promise to buy these, this whole group of drinks at the hotel bar later. Um, and so now on to the actual question, um, which will have to be reminded. Oh, racial funding. Um, okay, the, Pennsylvania has a broken fu school funding system. And that is absolutely correct. We, we, we've, we've taken as far as I think is politically possible, unfortunately, at the moment, to fix that for you, Which is, if we really wanted to be radical, if we were really committed to equity, we would have ended this practice of hold harmless, which is the idea that uh, we, we basically locked in all the inequity from before, and we're only applying this formula to new dollars, which is only a few percent of, of overall funding. And so we're, uh, and that's because, frankly, um, we're, we don't have the votes to, to do more. So now, the, the, the only way to address uh, this system, this, this funding issue, is to get more money into the system, um, which I, I absolutely strongly support. What, and I, 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 I absolutely agree with this idea that we're waiting for a lot of other social services. We're waiting for healthcare, we're waiting for, uh, for environmental policy, we're waiting for full funding. My fear is, and I'm not suggesting this is what you're saying, this is my fear, if you take that to its logical conclusion, it, it, you can, it's very easy for adults in the system to be like, look, we, I don't, my kids are coming in hungry, my kids, therefore, how am I expected to, to educate kids? And we're just gonna be waiting, we're gonna accept an entire generation of students who aren't learning. There's proof points of schools that are able to take those students and get high results. Uh, and, and so we absolutely need to do both, but I am not comfortable with this idea of, of, of waiting. It's, it's both and, not either or. Would you like to repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> Could you repeat that last question? Oh, I think the answer is simple. It's it's made it worse. Most of your kids are in public schools. So if you're having funds drained from your public schools, you don't have as much money to spend um, on the kids who, who are poor um, than you would have had if if they weren't being uh, funds weren't being drained to off to charter schools. Um, money matters. You know, it, it's really easy to pretend that it doesn't, but there have been some pretty sound studies in education that show that spending matters. We talked a little bit about my, my former district, and I told you the really outstanding uh, results we have with kids. A lot of it had to do with money, okay? Um, I had three social workers and two psychologists. That mattered, that really mattered for our kids that live um, in a federal housing project who lived in single family homes or sometimes no parent, parent homes. Now, if, if Southside High School had three social workers and two school psychologists and had a minority population, black and Latino, of 22%, about 16% was 16% free or reduced price lunch when I left, how many social workers and psychologists should be in every public school in Philadelphia? Right? You can get the results. But you know, we want everything on the cheap now. So we have this idea that we're going to throw out these little lifeboats, you know, an ESA here and a cyber charter there and a charter school here. And maybe it'll work for kids and maybe it won't. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is when you look at the preponderance of evidence, charter schools on the whole don't do any better than public schools. And the studies on vouchers, as Julian showed, kids leave the public school, go to a school with a voucher. There were several studies that came out this year, and they do worse, right? You know, at some point in time as a society, we, we have to start, have to start dealing with some of these problems. So the simple answer to that question is school choice, a la Pennsylvania, which is basically charters, um, has made it, I think, worse for kids who are um, in the public school system and who are economically disadvantaged. Certainly that's the case in Bethlehem, which is, I believe, a majority, minority district with very high numbers of kids with free reduced price lunch. Well, those kids came back to the district. Remember what Joe Roy said. 
20 million dollars would come with them. We do have time uh, for final thoughts. You'll have four minutes. Uh, we're going to go in reverse order. You may also use it to respond to something that someone said earlier. Uh, but this, unfortunately, uh, will be the close of the program. So, uh, Julian, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 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 Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
for all of our students. Um, you know, you also hear with school choice that if, you know, with the funding issues, if only those kids um, at the charter school would just come back to the district, then we wouldn't have a funding issue. That could very well solve the traditional school district budget problem. But what about those, you know, we're looking at the local issue, I made those 500 some kids. They chose to leave. There was something not working at Reading for them. That is not a, anything, any sort of slight on Reading. It's just a matter of that wasn't working for those 500 something kids. So those parents said, we want something different. If they all have to come back to Reading simply to solve the budget problem, does that solve anything for those students? I say no. I say we need to find a different solution rather than bringing kids back to a school where they just weren't learning. Regardless of, you know, if the school district's doing really, really well, it still may not work for that particular kid. And I would just throw out one other thing, a little plug for the ASC website, uh, federationforchildren.org. We have a school, cho school choice fact sheet, which I find very helpful. It talks about how many programs we have across the country. We also have a research fact sheet. Um, I know the first part of it, if I'm looking at, you know, in the, um, in my brain here, uh, 15 gold standard studies on academic accountability. I believe 10 found um, that there were positive results. Three found it was neutral and two found negative results. And we have links to all of that. What I would say with data, yes, it is very, very important to, for us to look at data. But just like when, you know, Ohio State report cards came out and some were good and some weren't so good. When they weren't so good it was make sure you look at the other factors that are in that school district. They are very important, and yes, we need to. So if your school district doesn't do so well on the state test, that's not so great, we know this, but there may be other factors that we need to address, and that's what school choice does, because it looks to the parents to say, what is it that made you choose this alternative school? <laughs> Thank you, she hit the timer right now. Okay, Carol, uh, closing. Yeah, because it's come up several times already, I want to give a shout out to the Redden Public Schools because they really have been transformative. I mean, they've, they've changed and they've improved and they've grown. The children are doing better and they serve a very, very high needs community. And I kind of disagree with, with something you said when we compare them to the parents choosing the charter school because the kids will learn more. The Redding Public Schools outperform the charter school in Redding. Um, so, I just want to quote something from, from the Enquirer, because you are a, a pencil, Pennsylvania audience, and, and it talks, it was the editorial board, right? It wasn't Carol Burris writing something to the editor. This is the editorial board um, of the Enquirer. It, it talked about in Philadelphia, for example, that charters cost the district $8,000 per student initially, and 4,000 each subsequent year, even after five years. And what that means is that those stranded costs were such that there were there was a lot less money for for the kids who stayed in the public school system. And this is the way the editorial ended. Though charters may be popular with parents, overall charter achievement is a black box. Some schools perform well, many don't. But there is no definitive study or agreement on how charters hold up against traditional public schools. It's as though the state has been spending hundreds of millions of dollars with its eyes closed, saying, don't tell us how our investment is turning. You need to think about that. You need to think about why that's happening and who the lobbyists might be. And if there are for-profit management companies, behind your not-for-profit charter schools. You need to think about what's happening. You need to think about your tax credit. I don't know how much you know about your tax credit. Your businesses can get if they make a two-year commitment. 90, a 90% 90 tax credit, right? You know, to put into a fund for scholarship for kids to be able to go to private schools and parochial schools, you know, you kind of think about that. I'm, I believe in giving. But when you get all your money back after you gave it, boy, that kind of sounds like a money laundering scheme to me. <laughs> and we see this all over the country. Do you know in the state of Virginia, it's 100% tax credit 
and then you can deduct it on your federal income tax. Fact checkers go into, you will find financial advisors online in the state of Virginia who will tell people, go ahead and do that tax credit because you're actually going to be getting money back. We don't know that the law is a good law, but you can do it. Think about what I told you about ESAs that Allison was saying, it's such a wonderful choice. People buying big screen TVs. Do you know what really got me crazy when I learned about ESAs when I was in Arizona? They don't have to show that their kids are learning. There's no obligation for the parents who are getting 90% of what to spend on their kids that the school district would have paid. That's the taxpayers of Arizona's money. They don't have to show their kids learning. Well, they have to do is show they spent the money. This stuff is happening all over the place. Between the tax credits, which are nothing more than money laundering, where you give the money in, and then you get the money back, and it's a way to get around blame amendments because there was, we believe, separation between church and state. These ESA schemes, they're being pushed everywhere. So it's the problem, we've spent mostly our time talking about charter schools. Become aware. Thanks. Uh, well, I want to start by just uh, thanking the audience for asking some really good questions and thanking uh, my, my fellow panelists. Obviously there's disagreement, uh, but I think um, uh, I mean, there's broad agreement on, on, on what we're, that all kids deserve access to quality schools. And I also, I need to make a plug, this is my first experience at this structure. And I hereby nominate you guys to do the next presidential debate. <laughs> uh, yeah, this fact checking is, is, is a good thing. It certainly helped me. Um, so I appreciate that. I had to to you. Um, I think I, whoever asked the question about, uh, you know, if your kids are fail in school, what should I do? Um, come up and introduce yourself afterwards. Because I actually feel like that is the most important question I felt in the night, which is, is if you are a parent, you're unsatisfied with the, with the school, and you do not have the means to move, you do not have the ability to afford product tuition, what are your options? Uh, I think that is the fundamental question. We want the, the best option to be your neighborhood school, if that's the case, and I want to see that moment grow. But if, if that's not the case, uh, you know, what, what policies are we doing to address that? And I think that's just a really important question, and for me, my experience with microphones. For me, uh, if if, we're, if we ch if choice isn't on the, on the one of the tools, then you're just taking away a key lever to, to give uh, to give parents an, an out. Um, I, I want to make two other points. One is uh, my my position on, on funding and resources um, is is I hope very crystal clear that we a district like Reading needs more. But I also think it's, uh, it's important to recognize that funding is necessary but not sufficient. And there's just so many examples of high spending, low performing districts throughout the country. Uh, I mean, again, in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh spends $24,000 per pupil. That's more than Wyoming missing. That's more than Susquehanna Valley. Newark and Camden, which has a, there's a state, uh, uh, a court case that requires them to get higher spending than your Cherry Hills and Short Hills and whatever the affluent areas are of New Jersey, and yet you still weren't seeing big results. Funding alone isn't what's going to make the difference. So to me, again, the pragmatic response is more funding combined with some kind of reforms. If it's not choice, which is the reform I support, um, it's, it's to me it's something else, but not just simply writing a check to schools and hoping uh, that, that, that things are going to get better. Um, there's waste in the system. There's fraud and waste in both the charter school sector and the traditional public schools. Uh, every scandal that um, Carol cited in the beginning of charter schools is absolutely true. But it's also true that there's, there's waste, fraud, and abuse in the traditional public school sector, right? Whenever there's public spending, there's waste, fraud, and abuse. Welcome to Pennsylvania. Welcome to uh, America 2017. And I think if you're talking about funding in Pennsylvania, you can't talk, you, the number one in, in any district's budget, I see members from the School Boards Association here, they'll say that what they're scaring them is number one is not charter schools. Number one is pensions, right? That is the, that is the cost curve that is that is hurting district budgets. We sort of kind of maybe solved that problem in 30 years based on what the legislature just did by passing a, fund, a reform fix, but you have to look at both revenue and expense 
And also, I encourage everyone in, in ter to look into the stories of the rubber room in New York City and the 800 teachers who are, are ineffective and charged with some kind of disciplinary, disciplinary practice who are going back into the classroom to just look at the kind of problems that, they're, that, 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 that we need to solve in, in the traditional public school sector if we're also uh, holding the, the microphone, microscope up to the charter school sector. Uh, and the last point, I want to end on this bipartisan note. Um, there, there is, there is ch charter schools is not a partisan issue. So the scholarship tax credit that was just uh, uh, criticized, that, that passed the, the General Assembly with, with overwhelming support, right? Democrats and Republicans. That's not a Republican issue. Um, Barack Obama was the leader of these top-down reforms. So bipartisanship is by, uh, by complete acceptance. Thank you. Can I just sure. I think, I think actually, a, I'm so sorry. We are, we are out of time. I don't want to respond. I just want to say that as a community, please reach out to us on Twitter, on our blogs, et cetera. We're very accessible. I write back to every email. So the conversation doesn't have to stop here. Karen, the Community Foundation staff wanted to make sure that everybody understood that the scholarship tax credit is only available to corporations in Pennsylvania. Primarily because we don't want 900 phone calls tomorrow asking how they can get this dollar. Other states are business is our Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of you. And I think the SAR and Y gave so much and am so generous with your time. So thank you so much for being a part of this discussion. It means a lot to all of us who live here in this community. It was a civil chat, so thank you. You did talk to me as well once again. <laughs> I bring it a lot of home for my kids. <laughs> so thank you. We always end the conversation with a quote. And again, we hope that you continue this conversation at home, in your school, and in your community. So in the words of Benjamin Franklin tonight, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. So may you go from here and get involved and be involved and stay involved. Thank you so much for being here.